Well, good evening, and thank you for coming back out for our lecture series on the, on the parables. And we welcome again. It's been a delight to have the Warrens here and to get to know them. Uh, I, I lost track of how many people, not just last night, but today, who found me and who were uh, just kept talking about uh, not just Sunday morning, but last night, and how much it meant to them. And were very complimentary, and, and some saying that it stretched them, and they were like, I couldn't take in any more information. That, that, that was it. And, and uh, anyway, it was just very... And so I'll just say, uh, Dr. Warren has asked that all of those things, if you could write those compliments down and put it in the form of like Dr. Warren is, and give those to his wife. He said that would be very nice to have her write them or read those on the way back to New Orleans. I really appreciate You're that. Welcome. You You're can't right. imagine how much hot water I'll be in. It really has been a delight. Uh, if you were not here last evening, these will be on, uh, Jonathan, these will be on our church YouTube uh, site, YouTube channel. So you just put in, go to YouTube and go to Central Bearden, and that will appear. And I'll just say, I think last night was the best like one episode presentation on the parables I've ever heard. Yes. And I've heard a lot of things. Thank you very much, and, and we welcome you again. Oh, may I, may I add, tell them what I'm, will you tell them what I'm going to be passing out to them? Would, yeah, do yeah, I'll go ahead and tell them that. Um, first, this is one of the friendliest churches we've ever come to. We sometimes come to a church, and this happened more than once, several times, where nobody even speaks to my wife. And uh, they hear what I tell about her on jokes, and they, no, <laughs> that's not why, uh, but You've just welcomed us with open arms. We really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate the spirit you have at your church, the focus you have, what you're involved in. And so it's been a joy to be with you. We're passing out some papyrus strips. Uh, these are from Egypt. I was there, it's been a few years ago, but I bought enough to where we regularly uh, uh, pass these out to people. We'll give them away at our museum that we have. We have an archaeology Bible museum at the seminary. Uh, that I helped develop, and um, uh, as well as some others. But um, at any rate, this would be the material that at least for the New Testament, we think most of it was probably written on in the early stages. And uh, uh, we have fragments of uh, pieces. We have some that are more complete, but we have about 141 identified and cataloged uh, papyrus pieces of the New Testament. Some have, papyrus number 46 has virtually all of the Pauline collection minus the pastoral epistles. And uh, we have another one. Uh, these are the what we call the Chester Beatty collection. Has the book of Revelation, most all of it. Uh, another one has bits and pieces from the Gospels and Acts. We have another one uh, in the Bodmer collection now at the Vatican and it has uh, a large part of almost all of Luke, and then it also has a large part of John. Uh, but we have a lot of these. Some of them are just very, very tiny fragments, uh, but some are much larger. A friend of mine, um, he studied at Oxford, and uh, uh, he says he actually thinks right there in Oxford from the Oxyrhynchus finds which were in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they were brought in boxes to Oxford. Uh, it's under the Egyptian Exploration uh, Agency. But he thinks they already, they probably have at least 100 more New Testament manuscripts right there. And it's just a matter of people identifying. With computers, the identification is getting easier. Uh, that's actually a huge help for us because you get a string of letters, you can run multiple searches and find the possibilities, and then you get another few and you can start identifying it a lot quicker. And the prior times, you simply had to know your literature well enough to figure out was it from this, was it from that. And that's why today we're finding so many more. Uh, just to sort of give you uh, a sense of that, I'm going to round the numbers off. In 1990, we had almost 90 papyrus uh, fragments for the New Testament. Now here we are, 2023, 33 years later, and we're at 141. And so we're finding more. It's a time when we're finding multiple types of manuscripts. 
Uh, some of it is due to the uh, methodologies. We can actually use certain types of methodology and look uh, about uh, five, six feet below the surface to find where to hunt for things and such. That helps uh, tremendously on archaeological sites. But then you get the archaeological sites, and many times you'll find writings that are there. And so it, it's a, a wonderful item. What I suggest is write a favorite passage on it. You can write it in English. You don't have to write it in Greek, okay? And so don't worry. Now, if you want to write it in Greek, that's okay. That's what my students have to do. And, uh, and they have to memorize passages in Greek. <laughs> and so, uh, so when they write it, that means they got to memorize it. Uh, we actually probably had one of the best Greek programs anywhere around in Kali uh, that I'd seen anywhere, Greek and Hebrew. Uh, uh, on the upper levels, we had them reading the entire Greek New Testament. And uh, so um, uh, don't think we just have experts here. We have experts in multiple settings. So I hope you'll enjoy that and uh, realize it actually is from Egypt. And uh, it's the type of papyrus they would have used for writing on, uh, on the text. If you want it to last about two years, you don't have to do anything other than write on it. Do not use a gel point because it bleeds out. And uh, you want to use a ball point or something more like that. Uh, now, if you want it to last a lot longer, yes, definitely spray it uh, with some type of shellac, uh, something like that. And... Uh, um, the other thing people do, but you lose the sense of touch with it. I've seen people laminate it, and you can laminate it, but then you can't feel the papyrus anymore. And to me, part of it is feeling the papyrus. So. We were short about 15 or something. Is that right? I will send some more here. That's my question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll be glad to send some more already. Oh, ye a little faith. I didn't bring enough. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, one of the big issues in our own personal lives is the issue of prayer. Uh, to me, it's one of the most miraculous things that ever happens in the Christian life. How is it that the God who created everything, to where we're getting images from almost 14 billion light years away, and the universe is even bigger because that's just going one direction. How is it that a God who creates all of that pays attention to somebody on this little speck of a piece of that creation. And he doesn't just pay attention to one or two of us. He pays attention to all of us. The greatness of God is something we consistently underestimate. And I think it's to our peril. Uh, we simply cannot imagine the greatness of our God to where he can listen to everyone and actually care about what we're praying about. Uh, I have a hard time listening to a group, especially of little kids, all the grandkids gra gather at the house. You know, I'm like, who wants to go with a walk, on a walk with me? <laughs> and, uh, give me a little peace and quiet, something. I can deal with three or four of you, but when you get 11 of them all together, and then it, it just gets to be a, a lot. God pays attention to every one of us. And we know that communication is a key to relationships. And no communication means you're not going to have a good relationship. There's got to be some way of communication. Uh, we have uh, several who are blind in our church. And uh, uh, the communication differs because they don't get the visual part of the communication. Because you communicate a lot visually. People who are deaf, they have a whole different issue on communication. But even they know communication brings the richness to life that they're seeking. And prayer is basically us talking with God, communicating with God. And it is a two-way street. I firmly believe that. Uh, I believe somehow or another God leads and guides our thoughts. He guides our focus and uh, he doesn't necessarily shout at us. I'm sort of glad if he can make that big a universe, I'd hate to know what one of his shouts was like. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but regardless, 
we try to systematize our relationships. You'll see it with human relationships. And what we do is we end up sort of saying, okay, I'll give you this time or that time, or uh, you know, let's focus on this right now, and now I'm moving on, leave that. And we end up almost making it to where we so regularize, so organize the relationship that it can almost kill the relationship. My wife came to me. She's going to say something. Y'all just wait. She came to me with this item, and she said she had read it. She showed it to me. It was accurate. And she had read that everybody needs to be hugged for five to ten seconds at least every day. I thought, I think that's fantastic. So I walked over and I hugged her. And I started one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three. She says, no, 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 that doesn't work. That's not what I mean. It's not about counting how long. You actually need to have a sense of the relationship going on. Let's see what happens when Jesus teaches about prayer. He teaches the Lord's Prayer. In the early church, that was actually... It's a bit of a Jewish Christian document. It's called the Didache, Teaching of the Twelve uh, Disciples. But it actually says every Christian ought to pray this prayer three times a day. Uh, and uh, that document is probably from the very early part of the second century. And uh, it also is not Baptist because it says you ought to not be like the Pharisees who fast on Mondays and Thursdays, you ought to be different from them. Don't be like the Pharisees. You ought to fast on Tuesdays and Fridays. <laughs> and so, uh, at any rate, you know, he, definitely the early church wasn't Baptist because uh, fasting is usually not our, our strong point. Regardless, on the prayer side, he teaches this prayer. And a lot of people misunderstand the Lord's Prayer. This is not a teaching of a prayer that's your standard devotional prayer. It can help for that. I use it in counseling. I tell people, you go and you pray this prayer two to three times a day for one week. If you feel like you're getting distanced from God, but you actually take time and pray it. Don't just say it. I mean, in elementary school, uh, on up into the early part of, uh, used to be junior high, we said the prayer at the beginning of every, every school day with the pledge and all. Uh, but it was almost a race to see who could say it the fastest. Our Father who art in heaven, I mean, you know, it was King James, and so we would just go through it, and it didn't always mean much to us. But if somebody actually prays it and thinks about the wording, it can be a powerful instrument for us. The Jews had a regular prayer practice. Some of that we think oriented around the Shema, but those were their regular items. That's not their intense personal prayer focus. And so uh, that's more where the Lord's Prayer comes in. But then you have to go beyond that. And that's where Jesus teaches this parable. So we're in Luke chapter 11. He was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Now, uh, what we're seeing here is then that means John the Baptist had disciples and he consciously taught them spiritual disciplines in their lives. And a lot of times we forget about the impact John the Baptist had. And don't forget, even today there are a few followers of John the Baptist in Iraq that maintain practices that go back literally centuries. And they still have daily washings and uh, they claim John the Baptist isn't the Messiah, but that's their lead prophet. Uh, they're Jews, but they follow John the Baptist on that. So, Jesus gives the form in Luke of the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to go right on past that. And then he starts teaching them some more. He also said to them, and here's where the parable comes in. Suppose one of you has a friend, goes to him at midnight, and says to him, Friend, let me three loaves of bread. Because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. Logical item. You don't know when people are going to show up in the ancient world. If they could send news they were coming, they'd already be there. <laughs> because there's no way otherwise to do it. There is no common person mail system in the Roman Empire. They have mail service for government official items. 
but regular people have to send stuff with friends or pay somebody to carry it. Notice Paul, by and large, will name people who are going to be carrying the letter to this church or that church. That's because there's not a mail system for sending it. And likewise, when somebody's traveling like this, and they really would rather travel early in the morning, late in the afternoon, late in the evening, and if they get there late, that's just how they do it. But they try not to travel during the hot time, during the middle of the day, rainy seasons, during the winter months. And so it makes sense in their context. So he comes in at midnight, and what do you do when somebody comes to your house? What are you supposed to do? You show them hospitality, and you offer them something. You know, it used to be standard. You keep a pound cake uh, uh, tucked away, and when they show up, you pull out the pound cake. And it worked, because most pastors, we put on the pounds. <laughs> and so, uh, regardless, you offer hospitality, and that's what this person is supposed to be doing. But it just so happens they don't have some extra bread at that point in time. He will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door's already locked and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. And the reason is most of the houses in the Galilee type context, in that larger context, are going to have at most two rooms. Most of them do seem to have two. Some of them just have one room. And so guess where everybody's sleeping? In the same room. By and large, they're all in one room. And so when one person gets up, everybody gets up. Pablo Freire, Freire uh, Brazilian, in education, he tells a delightful story on this, an uh, impacting story, not delightful in the sense of how good it is. He's giving a lecture over treatment of children and how you ought to discipline and not discipline children. And he's speaking against some of the harshness of the discipline. And uh, one of the people there speaks up and says, you don't understand our situation. He said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, if I don't get my sleep, I won't perform at work, and I won't get paid, and my family will go hungry. I fuss at my children. Sometimes I physically hit my children. And I make them go to sleep because if they stay up and won't let me sleep, they're not going to eat. And I want my children to be able to eat. He said it changed his perspective on a lot of things. He was still against some of what was happening in the home life. Don't hear me wrong. But I think what we have to realize is in this setting, if one guy gets up, the dad gets up, these little kids are going to start waking up. And they don't have any cars to take them for a ride till they fall back to sleep. <laughs> Y'all probably never did that. <laughs> we sure did. <laughs> and so he doesn't want to get up. I tell you, even though he won't get up, give him anything because he's his friend. Yet because of his friend's shamelessness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Shamelessness means... You don't care about the other person's reaction. You're going to do what you want to do regardless. And in the ancient culture, shame was a big issue. And you needed to have shame. It can be positive or negative. Positive, it keeps people in line. You have some boundaries, and you feel bad when you cross those boundaries. There's a sense of shame. They also, it can be very negative because people will use it and abuse others by manipulating them through shame. But when you get a shameless person, they don't care what anybody else thinks. They're just going to do what they want to do. And this friend is being shameless because he's knocking and knocking and knocking. and He's not going to leave him alone. And everybody's going to be awake anyway, so he may as well help him. When we pray, what we need to understand is we are not having to batter down the gates of heaven. This is what we call a negative parable because God is not like the one asking for bread in this parable. Sometimes we may be like that, but we don't have to shame God into answering us. Let's see how he follows up. So I say to you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. To the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you of his son asks for a fish will give him a snake instead of a fish? And in the Sea of Galilee, they have eel-type fish, 
but they weren't considered to be kosher for. Or if he asked for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Now, if you know anything about eggs in the country setting, especially bird eggs, not chicken eggs, they're going to be dark in color. They're not all going to be nice and white like in the grocery stores. And they're going to be smaller. And actually, they're more like a scorpion rolled up to some degree. So that's why he's using this likeness there. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? The only problem is that's not what it says, is it? Is it about giving good gifts? Here's what we have to understand. We give gifts because that's what we have to give. But you know what people want most? They want a presence. Not a present, but a presence. Got a good friend, Argel Smith. One of you knew him. I think that's here. Who was it that knew him? Argel Smith? Here. There you are. Yeah. Uh, Argel lived just up the road from us, he and I, after we moved off campus. We lived right beside each other on campus. Uh, but we would commute together, and we had a huge thunderstorm the night before. And he said uh, his boys were all upset about it, especially his youngest. His youngest was about the age of our youngest, his next one the age of our older, then he had one a bit older. And he said his son got up, lightning, thunder, everything going on, and he came into their bedroom and he came up on his dad's side of the bed. That was his mistake. But anyway, and he said, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared. I want to get in bed with you and Mama. He said he just didn't want his boy getting in bed. He knew he wouldn't sleep the rest of the night. He'd be kicking him or whatever else. And he said, no, son, uh, I'll tell you what. Let's go back to your room, and I'm going to get you your favorite toy. And you just lay down in your bed with your favorite toy, and you'll be okay. He got his toy out, let him lay down with it. And sure enough, five minutes later, the thunder starts, the lightning's flashing, and the boy's right back again in the bedroom. He said, Daddy, Daddy, I'm still scared. Help me, please. I'm scared, Daddy. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what. Let's go downstairs. I'll get you something to eat. And he goes down, fixes him a peanut butter sandwich, gets him a glass of milk. They eat. Says, okay, now let's get you on back up to your room, and you go back to sleep. Takes him back up there. A little bit more lightning, a few more thunderbolts coming by. And the boy's right back in the room again. And he says, Daddy, Daddy, I'm still scared. By then, Argel is weary and worn out from it. And he says, son, just get on up here in bed. I can't keep getting up and down with you. Because you see, what the boy wanted was not a gift, a toy. He didn't want something to eat. He wanted the presence of his mom and dad. And I think what we have to remember is that God's number one answer to us in prayer is his presence. It's his presence. And it's not that everything's always going to be good, but when our Heavenly Father hears our prayers, what He gives us, look at the text, give His own presence in the sense of the Holy Spirit. Now, they're not Trinitarian when this text is being, uh, taking place on the event level. So don't make them Trinitarian. The Holy Spirit's all over the Old Testament. Holy Spirit doesn't come about suddenly on the day of Pentecost. It's poured out in an unimagined level on the day of Pentecost. Don't hear me wrong. But what we need is God's presence with us. And our number one prayer should be, God, be with me. Whatever I'm going to go through, be with me. And that's a promise that God gives us, is that I'll go through whatever happens and he'll be with us. And I know some of you are probably going through some of the worst things you could have imagined, things you never wanted to go through, things you never want to go through again. But it's God's presence that will bring you through it. And he doesn't stop everything from happening. Friends don't do that for each other. Even if we wish we could, we can't. But God says, I'll be with you no matter what happens. And that is where I think we have to understand about prayer. God's not like the guy inside where you have to beg him, will you do something good for me? God will be with us, and that's his answer. You ask, and I'll be there. You knock, I'll be there. You seek, I'm going to be there. 
Now, what you're going to find in prayer is God's presence first. The other answers is wonderful when God brings those about. But they pale in comparison to his presence. Because that's really the focus of prayer. Now, he tells another series of parables, two more about prayer. Luke 18. Now, he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not get discouraged, literally. That's what it's saying, not give up. One of the problems with prayer is that we sometimes just get weary and we think, I don't know if it's doing any good or not. And we give up. We get discouraged. I think part of our difficulty is we have a misunderstanding. The bottom line is God doesn't need our prayers. He's going to be God whether we pray or not. And we have to understand that. Uh, But we need to pray. We don't always want to pray, but God wants to hear our prayers. And so the desire to pray needs to be on our part. God wants us to communicate with Him. He wants to hear our prayers. We've got to develop this sense of realizing He doesn't need our prayers but we sure need to pray. And that's part of the focus of this parable, that we not give up. So there was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. We would call this judge shameless. He's shameless. Nobody's going to make him do anything. Now, the implication on this text is he will only do it with the right bribe. Now, Miss Joyce may not remember this. Her husband was part of it. That's why she may not remember it. We'd had a big order of books come in from Spain for the seminary in Colombia. And as those books were coming, they got caught by the customs, the aduana, the customs folks in Colombia. And I was told that I needed to go get them out. We hadn't been there real long. And I had never done anything with the customs folks. I had no idea what was going on. I said, great, good, I'll go get it. And they probably laughed and said, what a sucker. <laughs> but anyway, so I went down there. And sure enough, they showed me the books. They're on a pallet. And they're all in great shape. And I said, great, I'll load them up. I said, nope, not so fast. You've got to go stand in that line. And the guy at the end of that line will be at a desk. And he's got to sign this paper before we can give them to you. Good. Shouldn't take too long. I stood in line. I was in line probably 45 minutes. Got up front, the guy looked at what I had, looked at me, looked at it again, looked at me. He said, you'll have to come back tomorrow. Said, Just sign the paper. What I didn't notice was he had pulled a drawer open on his desk, and I didn't realize that. So I show up the next day. I said, well, I don't know what's happening, but I'll, I'll be here. And I show up, and I get in line, and I wait again, and I get up to the front, and he looks at me, looks at the paper, and looks at me, and... He says, you're going to have to come back again. I said, wait a minute. What's going on here? I asked some of the people in line. My Spanish wasn't great at this point. But I had enough to understand they were telling me, you've got to put money in that drawer before he's ever going to sign that paper. And if you don't put money in that drawer, you're never going to get those books out of here. Now, I had a crisis but it didn't last but about that long. And I decided, I'm going to put money in that drawer. (laughs) He actually later was found guilty because he was earning over $40,000 a year out of that drawer. (laughs) But as soon as I put the money across there, he said, oh yeah, everything's in good order. He signed it and I was off with the books. (laughs) This guy's corrupt as a judge. This is another negative parable. And God is not like this judge. We don't have to bribe God to get him to answer our prayers. We're not praying to a God who says, oh, you didn't jump through the right hoops. Uh, You got to do X, Y, Z for me before I'll do anything for you. That's not who our God is. He's not like this judge. Notice what happens next. The widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. Do you realize what widow actually means? The word itself in its background, Old Testament, but it carries over even in the larger Mediterranean basin is one with no voice. And what it means is one with no public voice because she doesn't have someone to represent her in the public square. 
because it's a male-dominated public square. And she really is not going to get much of a hearing. But her persistence pays off. For a while, he was unwilling. Later, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God and respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. So is that what we have to do with God? Then the Lord, Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay in helping them? I tell you, he will swiftly grant them justice. God is not like this judge. God actually wants to listen to our pleas. It doesn't need, mean you should quit praying about certain things. But never think prayer is about battering down the gates of heaven. It's not. The gates are wide open. Folks, the phrase is battering down the gates of hell. It's not heaven. And God's wide open wanting us to come to him. It's actually the gates of Hades that it should be about. But regardless, we need to realize God wants to hear our prayers. And he wants to bring about justice quickly for those who are calling out to him. I tell you, he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will everybody simply be trying to manipulate the relationship or will he actually find faithfulness? Remember, faith applied to beliefs is believing something's true or not. Faith applied to people is always about faithfulness. Every Marine knows this. What's the saying for the Marines? Simplify. Always faithful. It comes right out of the Roman Empire, folks. They knew what it was about relationships. You're always faithful. You're faithful in your relationship to the emperor, to the empire. You're always faithful. And that's what faith in the New Testament is about when it speaks about people. It's about faithfulness. When it speaks about our faith in God, it's about faithfulness. Every Jewish person would have understood that actually. But they sometimes misapplied it. But they would have understood that they are supposed to be faithful to the covenant. And they're supposed to live within that covenant. And fulfill that covenant because their job was faithfulness. In that sense, will he find faithfulness when he comes? Or is he going to find people manipulating other people, judges and others who are shameless, who are only in it for themselves, self-centeredness literally swamping us? What's he going to find? And our prayer is, that he'll find faithfulness. He also told this parable of some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Now, this is one of the worst parables on application of any in the New Testament. And here's the reason. We know this parable. Are Pharisees good folks or bad folks? What do you say? Are they good or bad? We already know in the New Testament they're bad folks. Now, there are a few exceptions. Paul... Luke is actually more positive about them than the other gospel writers. But we say these are bad folks. So as soon as we hear Pharisee, we say, I don't want to be like that. But actually the Pharisees were the best religious folks they had. And they were supposed to be the role models for everybody else to follow. And so we usually end up being just like the Pharisee because we say, Lord, I don't want to be like that self-righteous Pharisee. Thank God I'm not a Pharisee like him. And we're actually doing exactly what the Pharisee did. Here's how it develops. Two men went up to the temp uh, temple to pray. So they're in the right location. One a Pharisee. He's got the right credentials. The other are tax collectors. Definitely not the right credentials. Makes his money off of getting more tax than he has to pay to the ones above him. The Pharisee was standing. He's got the right posture. That's how you ought to pray as a Jew. In that context, praying like this, and then we have a translation issue about himself. I don't think really captures it well. Praying by himself 
or to himself. Either way is a legitimate translation. He could be praying by himself. The only problem is you're supposed to be praying with God, right? So the implication may be the same either way. Or he's praying somewhat to himself, although the implication later isn't quite that he's praying to himself. And so maybe about himself captures it, but it's by himself in that sense. It's a little interpretive to put about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. God, I'm better than other folks. I may not be perfect, but at least I'm better than they are. I fast twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. It's not a hard fast because you start 6 o'clock one day and you go to 6 o'clock the next. I was in Israel over Yom Kippur one year, and, uh, of course, there was no food served or anything else. Uh, but they served us a meal about 4 o'clock in the evening before we started fasting. And then about 7 o'clock the next day, we got another big meal. And it was really not a big issue. It's almost like just skipping breakfast. <laughs> and so, but regardless, that's where he's fulfilling it. I give a tenth of everything I get. He's fulfilling exactly the rules. But the tax collector standing far off doesn't even feel like he ought to draw near to the Holy of Holies. Would not even raise his eyes to heaven. He doesn't have the right posture. He's not looking up to God in their sense, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So what does it tell us about prayer? You know, you can be in the right place, you can do all the things right. We teach our grandkids, hold your hands up and everything. But we know that's not really the essence of prayer. But you can do it all exactly like you want to. But if you're not praying to God, if you're really just absorbed in bragging about yourself to God, you've missed the real focus of prayer. Because the focus of prayer is a relationship with God. And it's admitting who we are and actually being honest. And if we're not going to be honest with God, we're probably not going to be honest with ourselves or with anybody else. And if you can't pray and actually say, God, I've got these problems. God, this is going on in my life. God, I'm not how I ought to be and I need help. God, I need you to work in my life. I've got these struggles on relationships, whatever it might be. If we can't be honest with God, are we really going to be honest with ourselves or anyone else? And prayer demands that we actually see ourselves in light of who God is and like God sees us. Those are two of the big teachings on prayer. Remember who you're praying to. Because the most important thing about prayer is not how you stand or how you do it. It's not even when you pray. You may prefer a morning time. I think that works well for most of us. But you may have another time that works good. I've found late at night doesn't work. I always fall asleep. But anyway, that's, um, I think God said, yep, there he goes again. But anyway, however it works. But remember to whom you pray. Because the most important thing about prayer is God. It's not us. And we're praying to Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth. And he's the one that wants to bring justice to his people. And that's what we pray for, for his presence. And for God to do God's will in our setting. There's another setting, but it's not a parable that I think also we have to highlight. And that's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prays. Because remember that prayer. He doesn't want to die, not by crucifixion for sure. And he's about as honest as you can be. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to die like this. We know he's not a lunatic. Because anybody says they want to die by crucifixion, something's wrong with them. We got places for people like that. You shouldn't want to be punished, beaten, 
hung on a cross to die. He doesn't want to die like that. It's the greatest injustice that's ever happened in this world to crucify an innocent, totally innocent person. It's totally wrong. But he prays, but not my will, but your will be done. And God takes the worst and our salvation comes out of it. And it's phenomenal. Never say the cross is something good. Always say God does something amazingly good through the cross. But it's not because the cross is good. Seeing innocent people suffer, that's never good. Seeing God use it, that's amazing how it works. Those are some of the prayer parables. We're going to cover one more, possibly two more. Yeah, we'll get to two. We touched on this yesterday. In the parables, you've got to have a context. This is one of my favorite, if not my favorite, parable. And it's the parable of the lost son, prodigal son. And uh, we know it's sort of set up. All the tax collector sinners were approaching to listen to it. The Pharisees and scribes were complaining, so we got two sets right here. And he tells us right off. And so we know we're going to have one set. Sinners, tax collectors. Now, sinners doesn't mean for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's a social category. It's not just a you've sinned, I've sinned, we're all sinners. It's actually a group of people who say we don't care whether we are Torah observant, whether we obey God's commands or not. We just don't care. We're going to go on with our lives regardless. That's the center social group, okay? And so they're outcasts from those trying to live in obedience to the covenant that they have with God. Tax collectors are in this category because they make their money by charging everybody else more than they have to. And so they're definitely scoundrels. I mean, we think taxes are bad. You don't have any complaints compared to first century. We feel like the minimum tax rate was 50%, minimum. But some were paying more. But then every five years, you had a special tax. Now, we're coming up on Christmas with St. Nicholas. And if you go to St. Nicholas of Lyra, we have the story about him tossing money in to help out at a house where there are three young ladies in order for them to have a dowry. Now, the other side of that story is he's probably giving them money for them to be able to pay their five-year tax because they're having to use the dowries to pay the tax. The reason most widows lost their houses was the five-year tax. And every five years, you had to have a whole nother amount over and above your regular taxes. So these tax collectors were just totally scoundrels. Because on the five-year tax, they'd also charge you more than yet they had to. So they're always making money off of other people in the most negative of ways. Basically, corruption. But the Pharisees and scribes are there, and these are the good guys. Because they're trying to live godly lives. And they're complaining, and they're not complaining because simply he's mixing with these. He says they're wel he's welcoming sinners but notice the next part, and he eats with them. Now, who do you share a meal with? How many of y'all have had total strangers in your family gathering at Thanksgiving this year? Now, I know a few at our church who have, but not that many. By and large, when we sit down for a family meal, it's our family. And we don't really go out to the streets and say, hey, you don't look like you've eaten today. Why don't you come in and join us? If you're eating with somebody, it implies a degree of acceptance and a social connection. And that's why they're fussing about it. They're saying, Jesus, you're accepting these folks. You're putting an okay on these folks. What's wrong with you, Jesus? These folks aren't okay. So he's telling these stories. The first one, you know about it, 100 sheep, you lose one. Go out and hunt for it, you find it, and everybody rejoices. And they say, okay, yeah, we got it. Sinners, tax collectors, we know they're lost as a goose, lost as a sheep in this case. And uh, you go find them and everybody's happy. Good. Lost coin, 10 coins, you lose one. You get down and you start hunting for it and you find it and everybody's happy. They say, okay, we got it. God celebrates when the lost are found. We understand Jesus. We got the picture. And then he goes a step further. And he says, 
man had two sons. And you can almost hear the scribes and Pharisees say, we know this story, Jesus. You don't have to keep telling it to us. You've already told us twice. I bet one of them's going to get lost and he's going to get found and everybody's going to be happy. We know how this works. And sure enough, that's what happens. And he basically says, you know, you're dead as far as the younger son says, Dad, you're dead as far as I'm concerned. Just give me my inheritance now. I know I'm not supposed to get it till you die, but I want mine now. Now, he didn't get the property. That would stay with the older son. He would get goods. Everything else that was left was going to go to the older son. Double portion versus one portion to the younger son. So he takes his and he ends up liquidating it. And he travels. And he leaves his home base. Now remember, this is a Jewish context. This is a Jewish boy. And we know where the representations are. The younger son, sinners, tax collectors. The older son, scribes and Pharisees. The father represents God. Now if you want to say Jesus, that's okay, but that's later in church tradition, okay? That's after the cross resurrection. That's not before. So before the cross resurrection, we're talking about God as the father here. And that younger son, as a good Jewish boy, would have been taught all of what he should have known about who God was. He would have had all the tradition of his Judaism. It's like somebody growing up in a Christian family with church all their life, and they turn their backs on it. And we've all known people like that. I hope you haven't had it happen in your family, but we know it happens in a lot of families, and it breaks the parents' hearts. There he is, and he squandered it. And he doesn't just squander it. Notice what happens. He goes and he squanders it in riotous living, foolish living. The older son will clarify it. He squanders it with immoral living. I'll just leave it there. Y'all got the picture. After he had spent everything, severe famine struck that country. He had nothing. Went to work for one of the citizens of that country. He sent him into his field to feed, and pigs are unclean animals. And so here he goes as a nice Jewish boy, and he's going to be feeding the pigs that he's not even supposed to be around. Not supposed to eat them. They're unclean. He's at the bottom. He's at rock bottom almost. Now he's going to get to rock bottom. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating. It's a bean-type pod. He said, maybe I can get, just get this, but no one would give him anything. He doesn't even get to eat the food of an unclean animal. Now he's at rock bottom. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? Here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. He already knows his background. All sin ultimately is against the one who created us and gave us life. When we waste our lives, it's a sin against God. In that sense, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up, went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. Before we keep going to the father part, notice what the son says is probably something that the scribes and Pharisees would have said, that's exactly what we think too. You are not worthy to be like us. God doesn't love you like he loves us. You ought to be a hired person. You ought to start at rock bottom, and we will treat you as a second-class Jew from this point on. You've been third or no class. Now we'll at least put you back up. You used to be first class. You've fallen down. All the way down to third or no class, we'll at least put you second class. And they probably would have been very happy with that. We'll see it later with the reaction. Don't we treat people like that a lot of times? And we're very happy for them to come back on the terms that we think they deserve, not what they need. And he doesn't deserve to come back as a full son. He squandered everything. He's wasted what was given to him. All of his dad's good name, all the input they'd had in his life, He's wasted it. He doesn't deserve to come back and be right back in the family like he was before. But notice about the father. I like Helmut Tielekis. 
focus, the waiting father. While the son was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. And you wonder how many days had he been out there looking for him. I suspect if his brother had seen him first, he would have arrived very beaten up. <laughs> he would have arrived literally struggling to still be alive. If some of the friends of the father had seen him, they probably would have done the same thing because they would have been watching out for the father, their friend. Because they would have been protecting somebody that they really didn't need to protect, but they would have done it anyway. How many times do we try to protect God? <laughs> By taking it out on people that are ones who have fallen down. Sometimes fallen way down. Regardless, he actually runs to him. Old men don't run to younger men in the Middle East. It doesn't happen. Oriental culture, same way. But in Middle Eastern culture, that just doesn't happen. Honor demands you wait and those below you come to you. But this father could care less about his honor. He doesn't care. He just wants his son back. Threw his arms around his neck. They would expect him to start pulverizing him and kissed him on the side. Still the standard Middle Eastern greeting many times. Latin America, we had it as well. But in that sense, the son tries to start his, his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, no longer worthy to be called your son, but the father said, uh, 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 uh. go bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, that's the authority of the family, sandals on his feet. This boy's not going to work in the fields. You don't wear your sandals for work. Those are nice things. I'll never forget in Malawi, uh, I was there for a time uh, back in, the, uh, in 77. And uh, people would walk down the road with their shoes on their head or they'd carry them in their hands because you didn't put them on when you're doing regular walking. You put them on when you got to a building or to a place where you needed your shoes on. You didn't want to wear them out just with regular walking. This boy's not going out there to walk. Then bring the fatted calf, slaughter it, let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive. He's lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And all the scribes and Pharisees are saying, yeah, the same story, Jesus. Come on, don't you understand? We get it. God rejoices when people come back to him. Story over. That's enough. We still think he should have been working in the fields. We still think he probably should have been a servant. But he doesn't stop this time. This time, it takes another twist. Now, his older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. I love the way that actually says it. He heard a symphony and a chorus. <laughs> That's literally what the Greek says. Heard a symphony and a chorus. Uh, we get our words, symphony and chorus, exactly from those. He heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother's here, he told him. Your father slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So what's the problem that the scribes and Pharisees are having? And the problem is they don't want the ones who have strayed to be taken back so quickly and so easily. They don't like forgiveness being given that freely. And they're jealous. They're jealous in the sense that these aren't how the rules work. They got to pay for what they've done and messed up on. There's got to be some penalty for them. He replied to his father. Uh, so his father came out. That's not normal. But he comes out, pleaded with him. He replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you. I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him. Son, he said to him, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. And that's literally true. He'd already given away the rest of the inheritance. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And here's what's amazing. It's an open-ended parable. Did he go in or not finally? We don't know. We don't know if he went in or not. Father made his case. He could have gone in. 
or maybe he didn't. But at this point, the invitation still just as open to him as it was to the younger son on coming home. Because you see, the invitation is not just to those who have strayed. It's also to those who have tried to be faithful. And God still leaves the invitation. Let's all rejoice together. I think one of the secrets of a church going forward is to learn. It's wonderful to see folks coming into a relationship with Almighty God. It's life transforming. We know that. When I came to Christ, it changed so many things in my life. And since then, so much has been different. Same thing's true for so many of you. And when others come, we need to rejoice with them coming. And let it be a celebration that we join part in. And we don't stand out there like the older son and say, you know, I don't like the fact they're not making more over me being here. Our faithfulness is what we're supposed to do. And we celebrate it, but even more so, we celebrate those who are lost, who come back, and they come back to the Father, and they're reinstated. We need to not be jealous. We need to celebrate. That's where this one comes in. I have one more to cover, but I don't want to cut questions short tonight. You okay if we look at Lazarus and the rich man? It's a parable. A lot of people say it's not a parable. Well, Luke doesn't always tell you he's telling a parable with Jesus speaking. Many times there's no, this is a parable item. But this one is a little different, and if you don't get the context on this one, you'll miss the focus. So the Pharisees who were lovers of money, ah, you see there are a lot of different groups of Pharisees. These are the money-loving Pharisees. These are the prosperity gospel Pharisees. If you got a lot of money, that's because God's blessing you. And you must be right with God. Now, it's okay to say God's blessing you, but you must be right with God. That part doesn't always follow. <laughs> because a lot of rich folks aren't very right with God. <laughs> and it's how you use your money that's going to make the difference, right? It's not about having the money. It's what are you going to do with the money that you have? Regardless, these are the money-loving Pharisees. They were listening to all these things, were scoffing at him about what he had said on stewardship and other things. And he told them, you're the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of others. But God knows your hearts and you're not justified before God, basically, because you're not using your money in a godly way. So for what is highly admired by people is revolting in God's sight. And then he has this little statement here. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God has been proclaimed. Everyone is urgently invited to enter it. That's... One way of phrasing it, but everybody's trying to push their way in. And you push your way in saying, well, you know, I, I've got more status than you. Maybe I ought to be in. I've got the money. Or you try to take it by force, whatever it might be. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter in the law to drop out. In other words, you're not going to change how God does this. You can try all you want. You're going to be in because God says you can come in. And you're not going to be in because of anything that you try to do along the way. Then he has this strange little aside. Everyone who divorces his wife marries another woman, commits adultery. Everyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. And this is with arranged marriage. And we have to understand how the arranged marriage works. And the ones who are most able to afford divorces back then were the well-to-do. That's where he speaks even in the Sermon on the Mount about some of this. To where they're not wanting to call certain things sin that are sin like adultery. And he says, well, you look at a woman with lust in your heart and you've committed adultery against her. In other words, relationships are supposed to be held sacred and faithfulness needs to reign in the relationship. But what is happening in this case, in Jewish law, the woman can't divorce the man. Roman law, they do allow that, but not in Jewish law, nor Samaritan law. Samaritan woman is not an immoral woman. She's been divorced by those other husbands. She didn't divorce anybody. That's not her problem. She's just simply one who gets abused time after time after time. In that sense, in this case, these well-to-do folks are treating women almost like horse swapping. And he says, how do you think you're right with God 
when your own personal lives, you've had arranged marriages, and now you're going to go out and marry women, and who are you going to marry? Because a divorced person doesn't have that much likelihood in that setting of marrying a person that's never been married before. They're going to end up marrying somebody who's been divorced or causing a divorce to where they can marry like Herod, Antipas, where he marries his brother's <coughs> wife. And in that sense, the abuse of the women continues, and yet they think they're right with God. We can't abuse the people around us and think we're right with God. No matter how much money somebody may have and think they're blessed by God in this context, you're not right with God if you're not looking out around you and seeking to minister to those around you as a blessing to them. And here's where the parable then comes. So there's a rich man who would dress in purple fine linen, so he's dressed great. Feasted la feasting lavishly every day, so he's eating great. He's living in the right setting because he's a rich person, just like these rich money-loving Pharisees. But a poor man named Lazarus, now he's the only named character in one of the parables of Jesus. It doesn't mean it's not a parable. It probably means it's coming right out of a real-life setting. And they probably even know who this Lazarus is. But he's a poor person there. So he's poor, the other's rich. Rather than being dressed purple fine linen, he's covered with sores. Rather than eating lavishly every day, he's lying at the gate longing to be filled with whatever falls from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. Now, there's two options on these dogs. They could be house pets but they're probably going to be around the tables eating the food if they're house pets. And he's outside at the gate. Do you remember what happened to Jezebel? What happened to Jezebel in the Old Testament? There's some dogs involved. What happened to her? In result is the dogs ate her. The dogs ate her. And many feel like that's the implication of the story here. It's not definite because he doesn't say it explicitly but it's a very real possibility. I won't say probability, but it's a possibility that these dogs are tasting their next meal when the rich man won't even give this guy some bread from his own table. And the reason we think that's a possibility is look at the next part. One day the poor man died, was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side, and he had a funeral and he was buried, only it doesn't say anything about a funeral, doesn't say anything about being buried. He simply... Here, now he's with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. Ah, uh, okay. He's treated like a human being ought to be treated, proper burial and all. But being in torment in Hades, the abode of the dead, it can be positive or negative. When it's negative, it comes into the image of hell. When it's positive, it goes into the image of being in the presence of God. But it's the abode of the dead. And so he's there. His is negative. He looked up, saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus. Remember, he's supposed to be my servant. I'm up here. He's down there, Abraham. Don't you remember that? Abraham, don't you realize that Lazarus is a nothing. He's a poor guy. I'm rich. Even in torment, he ought to serve me. And his attitude is appalling. And this guy just won't get over the fact that Lazarus is a real human being. And he deserves to be treated like a real human being. And he was blessed with his riches exactly to help people like Lazarus. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame. Son Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things just as Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here while you're in agony and everything is just. Because the bottom line is, he's not saying simply you received your good things. The implication is, and you didn't help the others who didn't have. And so Lazarus received bad things because you never even reached out and tried to help. You didn't do anything for him. Wouldn't even let him eat the crumbs falling off your table. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed 
between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot, neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house. Still, he's my servant. You send him. Because I have five brothers to warn them. So they won't also come to this place of torment. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Rich guy, you knew what God wanted. The problem wasn't whether you knew what God wanted out of your life or not. You simply didn't want to do it. No, Father Abraham. He said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded as someone rises from the dead. And what we see develop in the New Testament, some Pharisees do come to Christ. They become followers of Jesus. But others will not give up their power and their wealth and their prestige. And if we're not willing to go ahead and say, God, here am I. Do whatever you want in my life. Maybe we're not quite yet serious enough with God. This is one of those strange parables because it's an upside-down world where God says, the world says you're up here, but I say you're down here because you don't even care enough about fellow human beings to do something about Lazarus who's right there at the gate of your house. And if we look out at a world around us and we're not willing to get involved and be part of the answer, then something's not right with our faith. Something's going to miss because God's got us here to be part of the answer, not just part of the problem. And we're not called to be like the rich guy and just enjoy what we have in our life. We're here to use it to be a blessing to those around us. Having riches, biblically speaking, that is not the problem. How you use them, that's the issue. Do you see people? Or do you really not quite see people? Because the people around us need friends. Many times they need our help. They need somebody to treat them like real human beings and not second-class human beings. And we're called to do that. To where Christ dies for us. To while, where while we're yet sinners, He dies for us. Because in essence, God is saying, you're all first class to me, and I will give my life for you. Those are the parables. There's a lot more we could study, but let's open it up for questions at this point. Now, last night there were a bunch of questions. Come on now. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts about those? Or is, there, is there anything It's wonderful that we have those books because they help fill us in on the context. Can you repeat the question? Ah, yeah, the question has to do with what about other writings like Gospel of Thomas, other things like that? Now, what do we think about those things? And uh, uh, part of the answer is we're actually blessed to have those things because they give us the context that our text is coming out of. It's not always exactly the same context. We think Thomas is a bit towards the Gnostic side. Uh, we never want Thomas in our text. Uh, do you ever, have you read the Gospel of Thomas? The very last passage will tell you, I don't want this in my Bible. Because the very last passage says, and women will, women will be saved by becoming men. You talk about a horrible viewpoint. That's a horrible viewpoint. I like that one. The comment was, that's how women get to preach. I don't know. Anyway, I got to remember that one. Regardless, we don't see these books by and large as rivals for the New Testament. You don't really capture that well. Uh, we have maybe one very recently found document that has some of Thomas in it with our other Gospels. But by and large, they're not mixed with our books uh, that much. Um, we have one other one that uh, has 1st, um, 2nd uh, Peter and Jude, and it has some other writings in with it on that uh, scroll, uh, that um, um, codex. Uh, but we just don't find that very often. 
but they're tremendously important on knowing the context. And so it would be like today. If you wanted to know about the context today, you would want more than just a modern Bible translation. You'd love to have some of the books that are being written. You'd love to have some of the newspapers that are around. You'd want as much information as you could get, some of the items from the news, perhaps, whatever it might be. You would want the other information to know what the context was. So that's how we use these books. And it's not like somebody's trying to say, well, it's a rival. Do they sometimes contain authentic material uh, from Jesus from that time period? Probably so. We'd be shocked if they don't. But they're not canonized. They're not decided by the church at large that these are sufficiently uh, at a level to where they ought to be a foundation for faith and practice. And so they're not really arising to that level. There are some that get debated in the process, uh, but uh, they all end up falling aside besides the ones we have. And there are a few that are in that were debated quite a bit. Uh, but then the church says, no, those need to stay in. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I don't see that as a negative at all. We do have to have caution because some people will try to use them in some wrong ways, I think, at times. Uh, but they're actually tremendously good for filling in the gaps on knowledge and everything. And we, it also tells us about the diversity that we had in some of the, the Christian groups that develop. Uh, some of these are Jewish Christian documents. Uh, some of them are uh, Gnostic Christian documents. Some of them are uh, main church, just imagination-inspired documents like the infancy gospels and such. Uh, but, but they fill us in on where early Christianity is uh, at during those time periods. So, uh, so I actually don't think they're a negative at all. Uh, if we didn't have them, there's a whole lot we would not know about the context. And uh, they actually give us an inside look from those who are affiliated in some way or another with the Christian movement. So, yeah. Yes. Did Jesus use hyperbole or humor? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, think about uh, it's easier for what? Yeah, yeah, and that's not about some entry into a, a gate or something. Uh, uh, we don't have evidence of a gate. Uh, now, if you think it is, there's actually another saying out of Iran, I think, is Persian. And it's about, um, let's see, I think it's about a, a, a bull going through an eye of a needle. And they don't have a gate either. And so, and they definitely don't have gates for bulls to go into cities uh, or an elephant to go through. You know. uh, this is hyperbole. And you say, this is totally impossible. And now their needles were bigger. Don't, don't misunderstand me. They were bigger needles. But there ain't no camels going to fit through that thing. There are things that are only possible with God. Humanly speaking, they are totally impossible. Definitely uses hyperbole. And he uses it about sometimes even uh, the opposing groups. Generation of vipers. That's what he calls the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is John the Baptist when they come to him in Matthew chapter 3. Well, that's definitely a hyperbole. But you catch the image real well because a brood of vipers, they're cannibalistic on eating each other. So he really is capturing the image well and slamming them with it. Yeah. Others? Oh, okay. I saw y'all pointing. I couldn't remember where the question was. I have a question from last night about the lamp under a basket. Um, it says, after he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. In verse 24, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. Can you explain that to me? Yeah. Yep, uh, I've got it right here. Uh -huh. Let me scroll back to it. Because it sounds like if you don't pay attention and get this, what is the it will be measured? Yep. To you. Okay, here we go. And so, um, yeah. So he's just talked about the hearing again. So pay attention to what you hear. And so what he's actually saying is, by the measure you use, how well you listen 
It'll be measured to you. More will be added to you. So how good are you at listening? Because the better you are at listening, the more you're going to find this has um, an impact on you. Okay. And so, I didn't yeah. understand that. About it will be measured to you. It's like, well, if God wouldn't listen to you. you know, but he's talking about how you listen. So and so the measure is about the listening. Understand. If we're not open to learning, we're really not going to get very far. I mean, we've all been guilty of not being open to learning. I mean, I've done some things, and then I figured out I really should have read the directions. And I just wasn't real open to learning. And sometimes I've messed it up so much that I can't even fix it afterwards. And nobody else can either. Uh, uh, but that's where we have to learn to listen and to learn from others uh, because we're in this together. A person who won't learn is basically somebody who said, my growth stops here. If you won't listen to people, it's unlikely we'll listen to God. And so we can pretty well gauge how much we're listening to God by our willingness to listen to people around us. Yeah. Which I don't like because that means a lot of times I'm not listening to God very well. So, yeah. Talk about a real life example. Okay. Yep. Pretty much the same thing. Yep. What are we to do? Yeah, when we see people begging on the streets. What are we to do? And um, are I we think. Are we to be like the rich man? Or are we to be like Lazarus? I mean, or treat him as if they're. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a real ethical dilemma for us. And the reason is, it's not like in a culture where you know the poor really are poor. Because they had. Uh, the one guy up in New York, and he's earning 70-something thousand a year off of the streets. And uh, he's doing it because he's earning a lot of money. Uh, we know there are abuses. On the other hand, we've got to have ministries that will minister to people like that, and we get involved in those ministries. The occasional case is so open to abuse that we need to have a way to actually make sure we're helping in the most efficient ways possible. But what we don't have license to do is not do anything. That's simply not allowable biblically. We've got to do something. Uh, I know uh, every church has their different focuses. We work with a drug alcohol rehab program. Uh, it's a pretty big one in our area. And uh, they attend our church, everything else that scared some folks at first uh, because a lot of these are convicted felons and everything else. Now, everybody actually is delighted we have them coming to our church. They have challenged us in ways we never would have thought of. And we've been able to get involved in getting them on their feet when they finish the program. Now, this program is six months, zero payment. You work your way through the program, and they teach you a trade. But they'll let you stay six more months if you need to, to break your friendship cycles. And we know that we put a lot of money out on that, but we know these are legitimate cases. We've worked with them. We know about them. When benevolence happens at a church, you're always worried about whether you're actually using it in the right way or not. I'd rather err on the side of being too generous, but on the other hand, um, I also know that it's God's money that's given to the church and we need to be wise in how we use it. Uh, but I think even church folks realize we're going to make some mistakes along the way. But let's be willing to make the mistakes versus not helping. The reason why I ask that question is because something, a real life situation happened to me years ago when I was in your city and I, it was in the dead of winter. So everybody wears an overcoat. I came out of my hotel, I went down to the subway as I was walking down the steps my coat off. I gave him my coat. Now this is dead of winter time. I have no coat. So what am I going to do? I went back up to my room and I had nothing else to, to wear. So fortunately I bought things that were that I could go to 
place in Jericho. Right. But when I got back down there, that man was gone, and that box was gone. And I knew that that man had clothes on under that box. Yeah. He took my coat. And I, I learned a pretty valuable lesson there, but the lesson was that I really shouldn't not be so concerned that I lost my coat, but concerned that, you know, hopefully that man, hopefully I showed some sort of mercy or generosity. That's right. But you have to, as you said, you have to pick and choose. you got to kind of have right. to use good judgment. I don't know whether I use good judgment. I, it play, he played on my... On but my here's the difference. You were willing to help. Whether we always get the right results is different. I think the problem comes when people simply are not willing to help. Scott Something's one. wrong with our relationship if we're not willing to help. Scott so. taught me a real lesson one time about helping others. I was coming from a preaching assignment, had my suit on, my shirt cut off, cold tie, driving back to Knoxville, and this older gentleman, a nasty-looking old Cadillac, drove by me, and he was down to his rim. He was trying to ride on a bad tire. He pulled into a rest stop, and I pulled in a rest stop too, and I said, I'm going to go to the rest stop. If he's still out there, I'm going to change that old man's tire. So I came back, and he had pulled out on the interstate again. And now it was sparks were flying. So he pulled off to the side of the interstate. I pulled up behind him and kind of scared him. I said, sir, you cannot drive this car anymore. If you help me, I'll change your tire. He said, okay, okay. So he opened the trunk. There were about six old tires in there. <laughs> and he pulled out one of them. I changed that tire. It was hot. Big 18 wheelers flying by. And I said, Lord, I just hope I escape this thing with my life. And finally we got it put back on. He was so pleased. And he pulled out his wallet, and I didn't want to accept any money from him. He opened it up. There were hundreds and twenties and fifty dollar bills in there. He was not poor. He looked poor. And he said, Here, I'll give you, give me a hundred dollars. I said, No, sir. Are you at church? He said, Yeah, I'm first Baptist church, Arab, Alabama. I said, You put that in a collection plate tomorrow for me. Would you do that? He said, I will. So he drove off. I felt good. I was sweating. My shirt had Grinch all over it, and I said, Lord, why, why did you make me do that out here on the side of the interstate with 18 wheelers going by and the sun shining down? He said, the next time I put him at the rest stop, fix the tire for you. <laughs> that's a good one. And try to help the man. Yeah, that's right. Somebody else will do it. But it's the willingness to help. That's what our world needs. It needs us as God's people to say, now, we are called to love our neighbor, and we will do all we can to help. We have to be wise on how we help. I understand that. You don't give a drug addict more money. Uh, you know you're going to have a problem. But you've got to get involved enough to still help him. <laughs> and that takes a lot of effort to get involved on some of those levels. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, and the, the audience that's there. Yeah. So um, when we're talking about the sinner and the tax collector, we know that the Pharisees and scribes represent Jews who are trying really hard to do it in the way that they believe traditionally they're supposed to do right. A segment of Judaism, right. Yeah. But the sinners and tax collectors are also Jews, right? That is correct. Yeah, that's what a lot of people miss on this, is this is a Jewish audience that he's talking to. And these are Jewish people that are involved. And so they're supposed to be the people of God. And that's where the parable makes sense, is they have been with the Father, they've left their tradition, they've left their teaching, they've squandered their inheritance as Jews, and they've gone totally, the younger son has gone totally the other direction. And these sinners, tax collectors, everybody's looking down on them. And rightfully so. Because look what they're doing with their life. They're wasting their life. But do we give them another chance when they're wanting to pick up the pieces and come back? And he comes back. And whereas the older brother might not have given him another chance, the father is waiting for him. And he says, of course I'll give you another chance. Of course. My son was lost and now he's found. It's kind of hard to wrap my mind around the concept that, the, uh, that they would have been totally uh, in disregard of Torah. 
that's exactly why they're called sinners. And tax collectors, they're not supposed to be abusing fellow Jews, but they are. Yeah. And worse off, for Pharisees especially, they're supporting the Roman regime by way of those taxes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, here's the catch. There's a great study. It's an anthropological type study done. And uh, uh, it was done by a fellow who actually stayed for a couple of decades in the Middle East studying some of their culture and all. He said, what we miss is one of the primary roles, both in the traditions with Jews, some of the Middle Eastern settings, as well as today, one of the primary roles of the older son was to mediate difficulties between the parents and the other siblings. So he was supposed to be a mediator on this thing. And he was supposed to be the one bringing them back together. When you think about religious leaders, that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So we're supposed to be mediating and bringing people back to a relationship with the God who made us. And, but that's what he was not doing. What he, he was not fulfilling his actually designated role. And that's what these Pharisee scribes are forgetting. Jesus is doing it, but it's their role too. And they're supposed to be bringing these people back to God, not just looking down and criticizing. So, yeah. So we are or are not supposed to dissect every detail of the parable and learn from it? Or yeah. One as far as the, the main points, that's what you don't dissect. What I've tried to fill in is the background info. And the background info is simply to bring that context to us today to where we will hear the parable like it was actually meant to be heard. What you don't dissect is, well, what do the pods represent? No, we don't go into that type of thing. Uh, what does it represent that, hey, he went to a far country. Where was the far country? Well, that's just not important on the, the parable. Uh, and so you don't dissect the fine points like that. But the context we do need because that will bring it out to life for us. You know, it's like telling a joke that everybody gets if you're in the right setting. And if you're not, nobody understands. I'll never forget a preacher from some state north of Alabama and a little bit up <laughs> near side of that. But anyway, um, there was somebody who came to Venezuela. We were over there for a semester, and I was asked to translate for him. And he kept using these backwoodsy colloquial expressions and jokes. And nobody had a clue what he was talking about. Some of them, I wasn't sure what he was talking about. And finally, I got to where I would just say, he's telling another joke. When I tell you, laugh. And everybody would laugh. And he thought he was really communicating. These folks loved what he was saying. But they would had a clue what he was talking about because they didn't have that type setting at all. That's where if we get the setting, we'll understand what's being said on it. And if you don't, you'll miss it. I don't know why I didn't mention that earlier, but the role of the older son. If you don't realize he's supposed to be the one that mediates between the parents and the other siblings, you won't realize that they're totally missing their role. They're supposed to be bringing these people together, and instead he's jealous about them coming together. So, yeah. It would be like the church. We're supposed to be bringing people to God. And if we get to where we're so upset about the fact they're not right with God, then we'll miss the whole role that we have. We're supposed to be bringing them to God. So, yeah. Pastor, it has been a joy to be with you. God bless you. It has indeed been a great delight. Would you join us in prayer? And so, Lord, forgive us when we have not listened and slow us down. And forgive us when we have not acted 
No jokes. Gently. And as you pray, not only.